Ladies and gentlemen, our guests online, help us make welcome Right Honorable Prime Minister for Papua New Guinea and member for Taripori, James Marape. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, our moderator, Vice President. Uh, I want to firstly appreciate the SRC for ensuring that this uh, dialogue uh, is possible and uh, uh, a response to petition is made in this manner. Uh, sincerely apologize for our earlier uh, appointment that was missed. Uh, we said I would come on the 9th, uh, but uh, all of you know by now we successfully received and hosted uh, uh, Pope Francis, uh, who is the leader of the uh, not just the Catholic faith and of Catholic faithfuls, uh, but also as a head of state, the state of Vatican. And so we had to uh, give him uh, a proper uh, protocol that was uh, deserved of him. And uh, I was with him on Monday at the Catholic Youth Program, as well as I had to be at the airport to see him off. So I sincerely apologize for missing our Monday uh, appointment, but I want to say thank you to the maturity, continued maturity shown by our student leadership, uh, that you were able to say, we can postpone to this moment where we could sit right through and uh, answer your petition as well as uh, put into context uh, where we are in the face of our 49th anniversary that is coming up uh, on Monday. And, and hopefully, after this is said and done, all of you are informed better. And you can, from your own faculties and your own schools, uh, able to be as part of a uh, resource uh, material where you can use to assist your uh, own individual decision making as well as your own mind in being informed on your country, what is happening in the economy space, what is happening in our efforts to alleviate and address the forex issue, what is happening in the inflation conversation, and of course something closer to you, uh, issues on your school fees and your sustenance. So I come with, uh, come with you hopefully uh, uh, a, a presentation that could shepherd you and indicate to you where we are in the four key areas uh, that you raised, as well as other areas that, uh, uh, if you feel, deserves further explanation. You saw today, uh, I got two ministers with me and a member of parliament with me, uh, also, as well as uh, Chief Secretary, uh, and then the Secretary for uh, the Higher Education and Secretary for uh, the National Planning. Uh, leaders speak our uh, vision and our foresight uh, but our implementers also are there to ensure they get it work. So we all work in tandem for our country. And I want to say uh, and acknowledge the uh, ministers uh, and uh, Honorable Hamuli as well as uh, our secretaries for joining us in this moment. Uh, University Chancellor, uh, I almost say His Excellency Robert Igara, but uh, in any case, University uh, Chancellor, uh, Mr. Igara, uh, thank you for your leadership continued, continuously. And of course, Professor Nambu, Vice Chancellor, I want to say appreciate your wisdom and your leadership here in this important juncture. Uh, we've been welcomed to the states, uh, joined on the states by our Secretary for Treasury, uh, Secretary uh, Andrew Oeka. So, uh, students, you did welcome me, and others, can you uh, uh, welcome him to the uh, states also? <laughs> and I want to uh, I want to indicate from the outset if there are any uh, if there are free, free Three moments you have in your in your study uh, periods. If there are any issues you need for us to come and uh, make workshop on presentations on, to assist you understand what is happening, uh, we very much welcome to come. I, for one, don't like just speeches. I like statistics to assist uh, in in the speeches. So you know, data from where we've come from, pre-1975, for instance, right through up till today, so that and we model out on how we will go into the future, so that the the uh, Vice President, you made mention on uh, us being classified as lower middle, lower lower income country. Uh, we were lower income. We had the privilege of making transition from lower income into lower middle income any country, I think two years ago. And our own government envisions. And Vision 2050 also sets a target uh, that by 2050 we must be in the top 50 nations. Uh, our own government has set a, a mid-range focus that by the time we come into the 2030s, we must be a middle income earning nation. And so these are targets we've set. 
so that we work towards. Now, when we talk about the economy, or growth in the economy, focusing on the economy, it's all about job creation. It's all about having more money to ensure our social sectors and everything else is being met with the, with the money that needs to service them and assist all of us get going. So our focus has always remained growing the economy. Yesterday, however, after uh, we defeated the vote of no confidence, uh, instead of going on celebrating, uh, we went back into work. Uh, I kept the media waiting for almost two hours. The coalition partner leaderships and the senior Pangu leaders, we went into uh, recess again at, the, at my office uh, at uh, Parliament House. We spent two hours revisiting what must be our priorities. And uh, yesterday I did announce to the media, and I want to take this moment also to announce to everyone that my coalition partners and the senior Pangu leadership team have now elevated, instead of growing the economy as number one, uh, we've elevated law and order, maintenance of law and order as a number one priority. We've got five focus. We went to the elections in 2022, campaigning on five principal focus areas as, as a Pangu party and Pangu-led coalition. The first focus has always been, and that has been my personal mantra. When I took office in 2019, it was all about growing the economy for me. My major focus was all about growing the economy. My rationale was simple. When you have money, you can do everything. When you don't have money, you can dream and dream, but nothing gets translated. And I will give you a, a quick backdrop on our country's uh, history, how we've traveled from the 60s, 70s, all the way up to today as my presentation is being picked up. But I want to say, yesterday after the vote was dispensed with, the motion of no confidence was dispensed with. And I thank every one of you who uh, pray on a neutral ground. Uh, as Christians you pray, you pray on a neutral ground. You don't skew your prayer towards a politician that you favor or a government that you support. Pray on a neutral ground always for the will of God to prevail. Yesterday I went with two speeches. Uh, my office knows. I told one officer to write a uh, congratulations speech if the alternate emerges. And the other officer I told, you prepare a speech for us if we do continue. Because I was very open about this. It's not my personal business. Running country is a matter that belongs to all leadership that are in parliament. And last week when we were in, in recess, parliament recess to entertain the vote, I told members of my caucus, and a few of them sit with me here today, they're witness to it. We're not going to fly to a uh, fly to lockdown in Alatau or Kokopo or someplace. Uh, we will not strictly lock you all down. You've got one week to decide. It's two candidates, the alternate and the incumbent. Uh, which one you prefer? Come the day for the vote, you decide according to your conscience and the choices on offer. Whether I continue from the reconstruction that we've started in 2019 or start afresh with someone who can maybe do his own thing. And uh, yesterday I was privileged to uh, the members of parliament did decided in the majority that we continue on and I want to uh, indicate to everyone we spent two hours revisiting what is our priority and my combined caucus of party leaders decided whilst you want to grow the economy let's secure our country first and so they've elevated law and order focus to number one and my growing the economy comes number two the other three is education and social sector uh, opening the infrastructure uh, for our country ranks number three, education, infrastructure, uh, education, health, and infrastructure ranks uh, in that five. So our five focus remains. Uh, law and order ranks number one now. We're in the economy number two, education number three, uh, health number four, and opening our country with key enabling infrastructures rank number one. If you want to ask what are we all about, we come in that five key focus. Everything else dovetails into that focus space. Uh, if you don't mind, give me the next... Uh, next uh, uh, 10 to 20 minutes to hopefully go through what I have prepared. And in between this, uh, if a few of you, especially from the faculties you, faculties you uh, represent, if you want to ask a few questions, we certainly can take a few questions so that at the end of everything uh, we are saying here, you go out knowing that uh, even if not all is being progressed, there have be, been progress made in some of the issues that you've raised. And I want to say that uh, uh, work is not over yet from outset. When I took over in 2019, it was, I think, here or the other auditorium. I, I measured our country's delivery up till today, and even my own government's delivery up till today. I was very hard on all ourselves. From 75 up till today, or from 2019 up till today, our delivery to our people still ranks under, uh, under 30% in my view. One to 10, three. Uh, 
zero to hundred percent, thirty percent. We have a lot of ground to cover in as far as service delivery to our people. And I'm being honest and upfront to all of you, my children who will be your leaders today, and you will be holding leadership in our country going forward. For it, I was once like you, 1994. I left this wonderful school. And by the way, if I could, if I could throw in. Minister Ninigi tells me he left this school 40 years ago. And he said, it's never come back here. And I said, what have you been doing all this time? You better come back to your old school. And uh, we've sat here and we've discussed that all the alumni out there, former UPNG students, uh, from our own pockets, if you can give a kina, you give a kina. Uh, some of us who can give 10 kina, will give 10 kina. And we assist in ref refurbishment of dormitories. Not asking for government, but all alumni of UPNG out there, we could have a program going. so. We could assist in our students' dormitory. I'm willing to lead in this front uh, to ensure our student dormitories. A few years back, we wanted to work on it when Heturua got burnt down. I don't know whether Heturua is being rebuilt yet or not yet, but uh, when it got burnt down, some of our ex UPNC students got around and we said, why don't we contribute to rebuild up? But uh, in any case, I want to say all UPNC alumni out there listening in, forget about who you're supporting the political divide, uh, forget about which religion you come from. Uh, if you are working or if you are able to have some disposable income, uh, we can all contribute to uh, coming back and assist uh, making our school uh, in whatever support we can give. Because uh, I never knew I'll be Prime Minister, to be honest. When I was a student here 30 years ago, and here I am. I never contested in Tarifori in 27 to be Prime Minister, but here I am. And so having uh, known that the journey of life took me thus far, I am 100% absolutely certain. All of you here, all of you here will be women and men playing your own role in making sure your country is progressed from where we are today. So I just want to say that the uh, University of Papua New Guinea has been a very fertile ground and uh, we look forward to coming back for better engagements. Uh, if I could have my presentations up on the board, please. Uh, go back to the overview. All right, we will get through this one. The, we will uh, quickly go through the uh, economic overview on how we've come. I'll uh, have a, uh, we'll have a session on the foreign currency shortage, one of the issues that you raised. We'll have a session on the inflation. Uh, we'll have a session on law and order uh, and the tested scholarship that you, uh, you, you raised. And also, I'll have one or two other supporting notes later. And if I could throw in a caveat, this, may, this sessions may not be a detailed session where you would, you would fully be uh, satisfied. I got Treasury Secretary here, uh, Planning Secretary, even police commissioner and others can come in in a series of uh, presentations at a time that you are available and the fact that it doesn't conflict with your study uh, study calendars and uh, we, we could uh, make continued presentation if you feel it is necessary. For me, I think it is absolutely necessary simply on the backdrop that you and your informed, uh, informed mind could assist in ensuring we permeate our country with positive messages. Now let me go to the second slide. Uh, do I have a do I have a, a point or something? No gada. Our second slide, um, uh, but uh, something where we could. Uh, all right. The second slide shows basically, basically where we have where we have traveled as a nation. You look look on this one in that slide. You got 1960 there, 1970 there, 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010, and up to the 2020s. Uh, we, we've, we've stopped this, uh, the, uh, the graphs at, at 2022. Our 2023 numbers and our 2024 numbers are still running as we speak. Uh, but if you see the first, first, uh, first line up at the top, that's where our economy, the size of our economy, size of our economy. That's how we've traveled. You look at from uh, 1960 all the way to 19... Uh, 2010, 2000, there was almost 2002, 2003, we were still under 10 billion kina in the size of our economy. In the size of our economy. 1960, all the way to 2010. I put 1960 because our nation was emerging. 1964, we had our first House of Representative meetings. The House of Assembly was met there. 1968 was a second. 1972, prior to self-government and independence, and 1975, independence. So that's how we basically come. In summary, 
our economy was not big. That's why when I took office in 2019, my first conversation, growing the economy, I made no apology when I sat on Pogra today to get a higher return from Pogra. Because for me, principally, growing the economy gives me the ability to build roads, build schools, fix law and order, and everything else. Because when you ask for every, every country demands development, and that is people's entitlement. But where do you get the money to pay? University lecturers, upkeep, maintaining of dormitories, et cetera, et cetera. It comes from the size of our economy. And so if you put your page on 2010, and uh, if I could just point to you, 1975, our economy was still under 5 billion kina. 2002, our economy was 17 billion kina. 27 years, we grew by just 12 billion kina. 2002, put your mind, mind uh, page on your, in your mind. 2002, at 17 billion kina. Somalia took over in 2002. We had good eight years. Somalia had the luxury of the political party law that gave him stability in the first five years. Trust about Filmon really went on a buckle up and he tightened the buckles in our country. Key policy drives like export driven strategy, opening up SABLs, waking the forestry sector. And he had five years, it was hard five years. You look at the bottom graph, you look at the bottom line here. You look at from 1999 to almost 2002, the red. Red indicates negative, negativity in our economy. We were posting, we were in almost recession. We were going through hard time. Inflation very high. Our forex, at one time our forex had only two weeks of cover. Two weeks of cover in our forex. That was in the 90s. In, I want to take your mind back in the from 1988, and I don't blame politicians that time, 1988 to 2001, we had Bougainville crisis. We had a global financial crisis in 1997. There was a big drought in 1997. We had government change over, and every two years, government was changing in the 90s and 80s. There was no stability for whoever was in government at that time to really roll out. That's why if you look at the bottom line, please academics who teach economy here and teach politics, just get into these hard facts and inform our students correctly as to how we've come as a country. Have you been, has someone taught you these historical facts? If someone has not been teaching you this historical fact, Vice Chancellor and Chancellor, I don't know what we've been teaching them up there. This is our country's history. We've had this in our files all the time. If you look at from the 80s all the way to 2000s, we were in a very bad place. I want to place on record my appreciation to Prime Minister Somare. The late father of our country is no longer with us. When he came on board, he started the resuscitation of our economy. And if you look at the graph, we start to look at the growth that is taking place in all three lines here. I'm, start, I'm standing here. From here, all the way up. That's the last 20 years. 22 years. The last 22 years, we started to see, and we were putting on growth in the economy. And I want to say, in every economic school will teach you Population, and I'm not an economist, by the way. I'm, a, I'm just a layman. I've done my own side studies and through practical experience. Population must grow below economic growth. If you have an economy that is growing higher than population growth rate, you have a sustainable economy that looks after its population. If the population grows higher than the economic growth rate, then you are in an unsustainable territory in as far as government, economy, and people. And Somare government set the, really the basis. 2008, PNG LNG came into the picture, and PNG LNG became the impetus or catalyst for a big growth. From 2002, our economy was a 17 billion kina economy. In 2024 today, if we go the way we are going, we'll be a 124 billion kina economy by the end of this year. That is the story of our country. When I took over from Mr. O'Neill in 2019, we were almost at 80 billion in the economy. And so we're working this space uh, very aggressively in everything we can do. Next slide, I think that is, I'm just running ahead of my slides. The next slide, please. So that just gives you, I will, I will, I will tell them about the slides and I will circulate to all you, uh, uh, the faculties here so that they'll be distributed. So in 2012, our GDP was a 31 billion in the economy. 2014, our GDP was a 43 billion kina economy. 2016, 67 billion kina economy. 
2018, $80 billion, 80 billion Kenya economy, and here in 20, uh, 2023, we are a 111 billion Kenya economy. When I took office in 2019, I publicly said, I made a couple of statements. Richest black Christian nation is our destination. That's a recent 2050 statement. It, we arrived there in 2050. But I said to get there, an indication for our country, if we hit 200 billion Kenya economy in 10 years, then we are traveling on the right road to get into that destination. So we, you know, based on this headline, and yesterday when I, when I made my speech accepting the defeat of the motion, I said, goalpost has not changed. We are tracking in that part of reconstruction we've made in 2019. And hopefully, thank you, thank you, brother. Hopefully, uh, priorities in between can change, but we will, we will still, in as far as our economy focus is concerned, every conversation we make to grow the economy and head into a 200 billion Kenya economy by the time we arrive in 2029. The way we are tracking today, when COVID-19 hit us in 2020, it made us reset. COVID-19 is not a PNG phenomenon, it affected global economy. COVID-19 caused global inflation to rise anywhere, in any economy, depending on the scale of the economy, a rise in inflation by five to seven percent, some economy was even higher than seven and into double digit figures. And so COVID-19 set a reset for us, and we relook at our aim to be a 200 billion Kenya economy by 2029. We now push it back to 2031, 2031. And so that, that has been our story, if I could run through in the interest of time. The last five years under my watch, we did made an increase by 43 billion Kenya in the size of economy at a quantum, at a quantum size of economy. And some will question us in, a, in, the, in, the, in, in our budget use strategy, I want to inform students and faculty here. Any government has tools before them to grow the economy. For PNG, two fundamentally key policy tools we have, fiscal policy and monetary policy. Monetary policy is in the domains of central bank. Fiscal policy is in the domain of the executive government. That's where the treasury sector comes in. So we've applied an expansionary fiscal policy that is also responsible without allowing our debt to go out of, out of hand. An expansionary fiscal policy to sustain our economy, create employment, expand economy, sustain essential services to get our country moving in the right place. I want to indicate to every one of you, when government spends a kina in a budget, our target is to hit, that kina must have an impact of four kina in the economy. That was our modeling. Any kina we spend must benefit the economy four times. And we try the absolute best uh, to, to ensure that we grow the economy, while at the same time, in the quantum, reduce our debt. And many talk about our debt. I think hopefully in my slide, if there's a picture or debt slide, I will explain on this. But our debt is not out of control. When I took office, the actual number on debt record was under 35% when we engaged a broad spectrum of international stakeholders. IMF was asked to come back in. World Bank, ADB, Australian, uh, uh, the Australian program, Japanese program, we asked them, have a look into our economy and see where we are. And one of the major issues they are certain was the debt we have in our economy. And we work to clean up the debt, retiring heavy expensive debts and refinancing with cleaner, cleaner, lighter debt. And one kind of same, me talk with sin, plenty to outside by Aram. Suppose you got, you go on blood, you know, line that you kiss him, you know, where interest rate will charge you 50%. Now, I'm suffocating you. Then you go around a pining Musad by giving you 20% dinar. So you seem like same kind of money, now you beg him back 50% dinar, now you stop like 20%. We've deliberately migrated away from heavy, expensive commercial, commercial borrowings of the past government, and we went to lower, long, long term borrowings with concessional element. Concessional means 2%, 3% at most, with a five year grace period in between. And uh, we've uh, used that approach to try to ensure we have a budget that we finance to f keep our country running the last five years. And I want to give you all uh, my assurance, we're not recklessly managing our economy. We know exactly what we are doing. Our debt is sustainable. If you look at, and by the way, I want to also say, since 1975, the seven prime ministers before me, not one time our country have defaulted on any borrowings that we've made. The debts to together we have today, the cumulative debt of the entire 49 years of our country, one 
small but good record we have in our debt management, we have never defaulted once in all our borrowings and all the international lending agencies, IMF, World Bank, ADB, for instance, say PNG has a good record in that space. COVID-19 really offset the global economy. Most nations today, you do your research, I don't have it up here with me, but your research will confirm. Most economy carry a debt to GDP above 80%. Now I repeat, most economies globally, most countries rather, carry a debt profile in their countries at above 80%. PNG now, we at 51%. We are, for the first time, we have a 13-year plan. Today we live in the first year of the 13-year plan to come back to zero debt, if not, and if I'm still around in the 2030s as an advisor, I'll be advising whoever is in government. Don't fully retire debt, but put the excess money into retiring or building up infrastructures in our country. So PNG at 51%, my uh, students and my faculty members, I want to say that it is at 51% in a growth economy. We are doing our absolute best to grow our economy. The economic growth is in the positive shift, and I want to uh, indicate to everyone, and it brings me to, the, to my first slide, my first uh, response to the issues you raised on the Forex issue. Forex issue. Uh, Chief of Staff, I don't know whether you have that slide I, from Central Bank I sent you. Can you call that one up? The Forex issue, I want to, uh, I want to point to everyone. Forex is an is a issue that is every day practically within the control of Central Bank. That's where it's part of the, mon it's within the monetary policy ambit. But there's an interesting slide I want to show if it, if it comes up for you to all see. The last 10 years of how we've been at the Central Bank in as far as our Forex is concerned. Last year, last year and 2022, we hit a very high Forex level in our country. When we took office in 2019, the backlog, backlog of Forex order went back as far as two, three, four years. Secretary uh, Dressley, do you want to confirm this? The backlog of forestry, uh, uh, Forex order was in years when we took office in 2019. Today as I speak to you, Central Bank Governor will tell you, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking here and see, he's hearing this speech, in all essential Forex orders, it is now taking one week, two weeks, three weeks. We've been clearing Forex order as we speak. All the other mid-term and long-term long uh, orders, we've now brought it back within months of clearance. So Forex is an issue that we've worked very hard to address. But I want to show you this slide. If you look at uh, If you look at this, uh, is there a microphone where I could hold and turn around? My test. All right, if you look at this, this, this is 2009, 2010. This is the level of Forex in the US dollar we had in the central bank. And this is directly from central bank, not from James Marabas treasury or our treasury. You had in 2009, at 2000, almost $2,500, uh, 2000, uh, 2,500 million or $2.5 million. We picked in 2011, Somare government, when the dear old Somare exited, uh, God bless his soul, he left our forex at $4 billion, $4 billion. And then you see the slide. Slide has taken place up until 2017. We almost hit rock bottom. Yesterday I was saying in 2018, I get nasty sometimes when Mr. O'Neill talks as if he's managed the economy very well. No, seriously, I don't mind new people becoming prime minister, but I can't give the prime minister back to Mr. O'Neill. That's why I resigned from him. The total erosion in the economic fundamentals of our country took place. This one slide alone tells you what happened. If we grow from here at 4 billion up like this, today we'll be in a far better place. That's why in 2015, Kina was pegged. Kina was pegged here. Before Kina was exposed on its own value on the market. Kina was pegged here because we were losing Forex. And so we were, we were living with a stifled environment here around this time. We came back on 2019. We realized what was at stake. Uh, we worked using our fiscal policy. This growth took place with our government's fiscal policy. And then we decided that we will now allow, based, and government is not doing this without, 
without knowing exactly what must take place. In the event that, in the event that uh, with the Kina exposed, Kina, uh, exposed on the market, and this come down, I will come to it in some of my slides later on. We have program put in place to ensure we help, the, especially the small people. Small people in terms of the tough time it will go. Because this alone, unbundling the pegging of Kina here, allows for Kina to be on the market, and we will then attract we will then attract U.S. dollar to come into a market. As I speak today, I hope to come back to you one more time here with a specific presentation from Central Bank Data. The last six months alone, when we allowed Kina to be on its own value on the market, there was over almost two billion kick, two billion dollar that came into Central Bank. When the money value of Kina comes down, the intention is those who have dollar outside they bring into economy and assist the economy getting up. We have experiences with many in the economy who are harvesting resources, but they were not bringing back Kina equivalent dollar into the economy because they felt they were not getting the fair market value of the Kina. Let me write out. Dresra, check three, you economist, or you can explain this La Pasta. Me no economist, let me give him the Salbrook booster. In any case, okay, so uh, I just want to give you all uh, my full assurance to you. We've now rebuilt back since 2020, in 2021, we rebuilt back Forex. This is August 36. Forex at August this year. If I come back to you and do a presentation in December, I want to show you what is, or this, this time next year, I want to show you what the Forex was in 2024. And, uh, but this is almost at the same level we were in 10 years ago. Now the difference we have, 10 years ago here, the volume of transaction in the economy was lighter. The volume of transactions in the economy was lighter. So they were clearing much faster here. Here now, the volume of transactions in the economy is heavier. There are more people wanting demand on US dollar. And so it takes time. And I want to ask, from this backdrop here, we're rebuilding here and we're coming up here. I want to ask all of you students. Uh, I am not reckless guy sitting here. I'm not a money man guy sitting in the office of prime minister. We want to grow this one all the way up. Just like the growth that Somara tried to put up, and the decline that took place here, we're now trying to build it all the way back. So I just want all of you, give us time. And in 2027, if I, this 36 doesn't go up here, I'll come back to you and I said, I am not fit to be prime minister and I can retire from politics. Is that okay? In the face of many tough times. And some of key strategies as I, as, as I try to link, uh, link, uh, yeah, go back to my presentation. I want to say, that for the economy, we are encouraging an export-driven economy. Same, almost same focus Somara had in the, in, the, uh, in the two terms he was in office. An export focus. That's why we put more money in the agricultural sector now. We put more money in the, in, the, uh, in the SME sector. The money we put in bank the last three years uh, BSP has landed already over 500 million uh, uh, Kine as I speak. Uh, BSP has landed already over 500 million Kine as I speak. NDB is slowly to pick up very soon. We will launch a uh, subsidiary of NDB Bank. Uh, it, will be it will be called uh, National Banking Corporation. And it will be targeting to lend to pups and moms. Wherever you are, you got to get on. Get on, stop in this. You can easy look kiss him. Money that you make him. Coffee, oil palm, cacao, vanilla, and uh, if you if you have a pets of forestry out there, why but sign a man come and cut him DIY you? Clan blue you can cut him DIY you and make him money. Students, I want to encourage you to think business also as you sit here. You know when I talk about one million jobs, when I talk about one million jobs, I can give you my full assurance. If tomorrow, if and by the way, we're progressing to complete on Wafi Golpu very soon. Uh, it's taken some time because I want to get back more for you and not for the company, so it's taken us some time. Uh, but very soon we'll conclude WAFI. We're bringing Pasca LNG across the board, and we're synchronizing uh, Pinyang LNG to come at the back of Papu LNG. Uh, the graph that went back, part of the growth that Somara has shown was really the benefit of PNG LNG that came in. So all these big projects will come. But guess what? Today, PNG LNG at the plant side here, when I was education minister, I was responsible for training of these young people. They're working. Today, big project for the economy, employment, actual employment, is only 800 people at the plant site. So even if we get 10 new mines tomorrow, 
the actual employment will be possibly 20,000. Now, ask me, the opposition ask me, and you will also ask me, Mr. Prime Minister, why do you say you will create one million jobs in the next five years based on MTDP4? And I, my own chief secretary and everyone challenged me. I said, my definition of job is not your definition of job. My definition of job is in the SME space, in the economic space, in people creating employment for themselves. That is where it is. And I want to ask <laughs> Chancellor and Vice Chancellor, I think that instruction and Minister Education, Minister of Education knows, in 2020, I issued instruction to the Education Department. In low education as well as high education, teach business, knowing about business to our students. Because our students, unlike students in Australia, unlike students in USA, unlike students in China, our students come from family that own lands in our, land in our country. You got ground law plus Mr. You don't have, only have to be oil and gas landowner to claim that you are a landowner. You already have a piece of land somewhere back home. If we can work to empower you to know about business, and you go back home and mobilize your people, especially those who be from the Nambis where no got trouble fight, or Line Bloom, Eastern Highlands, Chimbu, Western Islands, where you plus Sinan Penis, coffee, sleep, nothing stuff. Cacao, sleep, nothing stuff. I tell you one story in this segment. There's a young fellow called Kum Kimsonga. Kum Kimsonga. I told his story many times, and uh, I'm willing to take him back here for a session. He left Woodall in 2020. Instead of, he got a job to be a Didiman officer in a, a provincial government someplace. But he decided in 2021 to go back to be in the coffee cooperative with his family up in the mountains of Tewai. 2021, you know how many money they made for the coffee cooperative? 800,000 kina money made from the coffee cooperative. 800,000 kina from coffee cooperatives. 400 kina spent on the uh, cost of logistics, moving back and forth to lay to sell. 400 kina for profit for the 20 families that were part of that coffee cooperative. One smart young person like you didn't wait around in Lay City to look for a job. Went back to his mountain and said, I'm going to do something for my clan. Mobilize his clan and work and made money for himself. Today, that cooperative is a major cooperative back home. Vice Chancellor and Chancellor, Teach know about business. Even if they're doing physics class, they must know about business. Even if they're doing law class. Today I see so many lawyers, they don't run the law practice as business. They run around as if it's just another career. They must run it like business. And we take it for granted that our young people know about business. If you teach them about knowing about business, they will get out there equipped with additional knowledge and, and get engaged in many opportunities that are available in our country. I will come back one time here if you student do want me to come back. I'll bring you one guy from Pangea. He told me how he started off in business in 1973. Today, if you go to uh, go to Gero, just right here, he's got about over almost 500 apartments on the other side of, of uh, uh, Rainbow. 1973, he. He was a small boy, eight, maybe in his early teens. He said he was playing mumble. And he got his mumble and he started to pay for uh, all his uh, maids. They were, had coffee in their father's house and bring the coffee and he started to get coffee. That's 1973. And he, then he went into coffee buying. 1985, he had a trade store in Pangia. 2004, he bought his first shop. I'm just cutting the story. First shop in Waigani. He bought a Chinese for 480,000 kina. 2004. Today, he owns almost a thousand property in our country. He bought out Alatau International, International Hotel. He has a helicopter that he's now trying to fly himself from a great tree, from absolute nothing. He worked the last 50 years to today being a multi-millionaire. This is what I'm talking about, job in our country. When Ekilama grew his business, the economy was small. Today, you are operating in a 100 times big economy than the 1975, 1980s economy. And I just want to ask, I'm, I'm, I'll come back to my slide here. Key strategies, key strategy slide. This one, we focus on encouraging export growth. And I want you students who are here, if you have learned, and I come to also appeal to you. You can make more money from agricultural produce than getting out there in a first degree 
job salary in Port Mosby. Your salary in Port Mosby goes out to rental, goes out to buying food, goes out to everything else. I, I, I feel compelled to give you another story. There's one university student here who graduated about 10 years ago as a lawyer. Today he's still living in Morata, going back and forth, from West Sipic, from Nuku. He still now works as a state lawyer. He goes back and forth on a taxi and, you know, making his life in a city as a state lawyer. One of his grade 8 classmates left grade 8 in Nuku in the same year. Today he's a vanilla king in eastern West Sipic. He sells vanilla. He's got a Land Cruiser, v, not VX, a 10 seater. His house in back in Nuku's solar electrified, and he's living a pretty good life. Now you tell me, isn't that job? He's doing a job to earn money. My definition of job is not eight to four or six job or seven to five job, but my definition of definition of employment is citizens having money in their own pocket, earning from means they could earn correctly in our country. So I'll focus in one area, my, my students and our uh, faculty, encouraging export growth in our country. We want to also do import substitution. I want to stop on this one. The special economic zones we're having in our country. And Minister Maru and DPM were sent to see a, a program they have in Indonesia. They came back. One special economic zone that deals with nickel downstream processing created 80,000 jobs. And so I have directed uh, Ramu MCC, the, uh, the, the company that is doing nickel there, move into downstream today. And our, all, our, all our, any companies in our country, whether forestry or agriculture, fisheries, we are now moving into the downstream space later to go into manufacturing in our country. Import substitution is a policy that we are embarking upon to replace imports and also for us to ramp up on production. Rice, I want to indicate to all of you, rice growth is something we are working on. Minister Higher Education here in his district is piloting now rice growing. We are working with Rigo Rice, his district for rice and others. And so these are things we are doing to ensure we have no money going out but we substitute what we can produce locally and we grow locally for, for ourselves. I want to also give an indication to our students here. Our monetary and fiscal policy, we're trying to bridge them together without compromising their independence. Central Bank is in charge of monetary policy. When you ask me what is happening with, with the Forex, it is a matter I have no direct control over. As Prime Minister, I have no direct control over what happens in Forex. It's a matter totally between uh, within the care of our central bank, we're now looking at how we could bridge monetary policy and fiscal policy together without compromising their independence. And so I just want to give you all the highlight. There are some things we are doing in the economy in respect to uh, use the forex discussion to point you the picture of our economy. I want to go to inflation. Uh, when you raise the issue of inflation, and I want to uh, agree with all of you that cost of basic household is not affordable for everyone. I come from a family of, similar to most of you, parents never worked. Parents depended on what they find along the way. And so uh, I'm the first one to feel the pain, pain of everyone else. Yesterday when we came out of the uh, dispensation of the VONC, I wasn't celebrating. I knew the challenge remains big. And as a country that is import dependent, most of our good, the other day, most of us, you all saw in parliament, uh, Governor Baird bringing in tin fish and rice and noodles. Uh, and he did well to point to us that cost has gone up. And I want to uh, tell you all and give you assurance that we are not insensitive, we are not incognizant of this. And we've already been working on some measures to contain inflation from not getting out of control. Do your research, the economies amongst us. Global inflation sits higher than PNG inflation. PNG inflation today at 2024 we're keeping it below 5%, and we want to keep it below 5% in every year going forward, if not bring it down. We want to contain the inflation, but inflation every year is measured against price that is taken over from the previous year. So the sum of our inflation together is an aggregate over time. And government today must make sure we don't allow inflation to get out of hand. And we've made few policy interventions to assist all of us in tough times. I'll give you one example. The higher education loan program and uh, the Secretary Father Zuba was just saying earlier, only 66 of you applied for it. It's a facility that is open to assist your parents. They're not burdened to pay your school fee. I made this call. Uh, 28 of 
uh, December 2019. Was it 28 of December 2019? Hands up any one of you public servant of citizens who had worked on 28 of December. 28 of December. Not too many people had worked in our country on 28 of December. 28 of December 2019. I called the secretary in and I said, I want us to find a program to assist parents of our country who are facing hard time paying school fee. You know, 13,000 kina you pay for your program here, correct? Is that 13,000 kina? I don't think parents can afford 13,000 kina in this time. We put in place the higher education loan program to assist students. And this is an interest-free money you have. If you pick it up in four years, if you pick 40,000, you will not be compelled to pay 40,000 kina in four years again. No, you're a Papua New Guinea person. You'll be alive for the rest of your life in your own country. And with men, sir, it take your entire lifetime to pay something back to a fund that we are setting up so that your children can borrow from that down the line. Is that okay? It's not a fund to make you pay again ASAP. And I did my calculation, you know, you could pay, repay 200 kina a year, 1,000 kina a year, depending on your affordability or employment, and for the rest of your life until you're 60, 70, 80. You die earlier, well, we write it off. It's not passed to your family. So we've set this up deliberately to assist you so that you do not burden your parent by, please, 10,000 kina come, you go pay him school fee. 15,000 come, 20,000 come. So that is one facility we set up. We've maintained hackers and testers so that it keeps on assisting you. And I think in your fourth petition you've given me, uh, it's for us to look into how we could expand this. I want to give you all my, my assurance. The government system has been activated to look at an appropriate hackers testers policy that is based on your academic performance. Is that okay? You're not, uh, you're not giving me claps here. What's happening here now? <laughs> Maybe I spoke too much, so I, I better cut it off. I, I, I repeat again. We're revisiting our hackers and testers policy so that based on your mark, and I will be asking our, our higher education uh, department to liaise with all students, uh, I beg your pardon, all universities in our country on what is the GPA mark will make that intervention. You hit certain GPA, your government, your, no, not your government, your country can pay for your school fee going forward. Am I right or not? <laughs> so you have a job and I have a job. Uh, but my request to our, U, our UPNG and all our universities, teach two, two important curriculum I want inserted in our, our, our programs in all our schools. Knowing about business, and second is Christian ethics and values. These two, two curriculums must be input into all, all our faculty programs. Every student who graduates from university or colleges must know about business, and they must know basic about Christian ethics. It's about treating others with respect, love, kindness, not skewed to seven day because I'm seven day, or not skewed to Catholic because you're Catholic, but just a basic principle of Christianity about love, sharing, forgiveness, kindness, that I want to be taught in all our schools. So that our kids come out with our degrees. If they don't find a job from their qualification, they can start business with positive mind from where they are. And that's something I want. So uh, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm jumping straight to the last petition you gave me on, on, uh, on your school fee and haircuts thesis. I've, I've, I've told you now that please, uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be your GPA based. Um, GPA based. You want to play rugby? You know, when I was at uni here, I used to play rugby. I, was, uh, I used to hide and go and play in PRL. Those days it's called PRL. I used to play for uh, South and later university where the team called Post Puma. So playing there sometimes affect your mark. So if you, if you want to play and uh, play around and affect your mark, up to you. But I propose from off the cuff a GPA of four, but I'll, I'll leave it with our technical people to, to go through. So that I want the best to be produced. If I am to pay your school fee, I want you to get the best mark. Is that okay? I'm all right now. We can hold this. So school fee is one way we assist in inflation in tough times. And we remove project fee from, our, from your parents so that your younger siblings who are in school today, your parents don't pay project fee and they don't pay their school fees at elementary, primary, and high school. We did something for the first time we've never, not too many governments have done before, and that is removing a substantial uh, uh, personal income tax contributors. Those who earn up to 20,000 kina, they don't pay tax anymore. They don't pay tax anymore. They're spenders in the economy. I had to fight with my own treasury team. They said, we're losing, uh, losing revenue. And I asked them, how much revenue are you losing? And they said, oh, possibly 20 to 50 million kina. I said, our country, uh, has to, we have to help our small people. 
we can lose that 20 to 50 million kina. Let's remove tax from our people. I told them, they, my people, I know them very well. That little 60, 70 kina they save every fortnight, they're gonna, not going to keep in the bank. They'll go back and they'll buy the rice and tin piece. Give it to them. Don't, uh, don't take it from them. And so we were able to remove tax from those who are earning under 20,000. The last time tax threshold was at 12,500. We now lift it all the way to 20,000. I want to announce today at this, at this session. I want to announce today at this session, I've already informed Treasury. And they're working on looking at removing tax from essential household items. Removing GST from essential household items. This was a work over the last one year. We've, we started that work last year. And we today presently have passed over almost 50 million kina to IRC and customs. They're reconfiguring the ICT system that calculates GST so that when government goes to budget and says remove tax from rice, tin piece, uh, or soap, uh, cooking oil, uh, kind of same, then you go to the tills, you can have a system that is easier. Others you pay GST on, but in essential household items like fuel and food, then you don't pay the 10% GST. It is something we're doing to assist you in this factor. So I want to uh, give you all my, 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 my word. And we, we, when Kina was allowed to be on its value on the open market, we're not blind to it. It will not, and it must not hit a threshold that is not sustainable for our economy. But it was allowed to be up there on, the, on its own value so that we could get foreign direct investors bringing back money into our country. When Kina was not in its own value, when everybody else thought, I remember I think a year ago, the same opposition, the same opposition that is now marting off on Kina depreciation. One time I'll get, if you keep watch, I'll find that opposition statement that came out on newspaper. They said Kina is overvalued by 20%. That's opposition statement. They agreed with us last year. Today, for politics, they're changing around. And as a Kina is overvalued by 20%, Kina needs to be depreciated. And so, and it wasn't something that I did myself. All of us, we sit down. I wasn't happy about this, but when they told me, the short time it may come down, but in the long run, on its own strength and value, it will appreciate again, especially when our export earnings start to pick up. And so I want to give assurance to university students and everyone out there. We're not ignorant to this. We're mindful. I've told already Treasury and Central Bank, I don't want Kina to go below 24 toya against a dollar. And so that is being informed and we're managing this. But in the meantime, to assist the economy, if the cost of the imported rice, remember that rice is still being imported as we speak. That tin fish that Governor Baird sold to us on, on Parliament, that the cost of the tin is imported from outside. The tin itself. We may have the fish, but the tin is imported from outside. The paper wrap around the, around the tin is imported from outside. Or even the noodles. You know, when the Ukraine war took place, Ukraine is a 20% producer of global wheat. 20% producer of global wheat. When Ukraine is wheat production is affected, it also has a pass on effect. Rest of the food supply chain, especially flour based food, the cost of prices build on. on. So, that noodles that we eat, that rice that we import, we're also importing value of the import uh, inflation that is elsewhere into our economy. And so all of these are interrelated. I'm very mindful of inflation. I want to give you all my full assurance. We don't want inflation to go out of hand. If I put to you a historical inflation graph, you will see inflation under Marape administration is everything below 5%. Inflation under those who came before me uh, was not 5%. In few occasions, we were in double-digit figures. Uh, but I can't go into the past. I want to say for today going forward, be mindful, and we will remove tax from essential household items. And we've already established non-tax paying threshold at this level. And I want to say the student conversation, much of everyday need in our country is school fees. And a school fee assistant to our citizens at low education to high education will not be compromised. And the high education school fee based in a GPA, we could go into, into, uh, into assistance. I, went, I, did, I was sitting and doing calculation. If you are paying 13,000 kina school fee this year, learning secretary, if, uh, when you go to budget, if you, UPNG this year school fee, how much? 13,000, huh? On average, on average, okay. So if it is 14,000 kina next year, 15,000, okay, if it is 15,000 next year, and 2,000 of you have a GPA above four, 
Sector planning, you're not compr comp compromising much. For your educated Papua New Guineans, you're only paying 30 million kina next year. Memorida. So these are within the same money we have. We will reorganize, but uh, it's affordable. But at, you know, right at this time, it helps families who need help the most. So uh, we'll take care of the school fee in our country so that in tough time, it assists you in the inflation conversation. I want to go to a uh, law and order space. I want to uh, uh, say that uh, we've worked very hard in this sector. And today, yesterday, nothing in relation to your petition. But based on us from you know, maintaining government yesterday, my coalition party leaders, uh, Governor Ipodas was the main one, and others. They said, Mr. Prime Minister, we're giving you support, and we want law and order fixed in our country. And uh, this is the same cry you, you made mention. And I want to say, we're working. You cannot just attend to police. You must attend to the entire law and order sector in, 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 in the fullest attention to all sectors. And uh, I want to give you all some headline uh, indications. We are working to strengthen, and I, for instance, in the correctional service, we're putting money for expansion of prison services. We're also putting money into the menstrual services. When I took over in 2019, the menstrual budgets was under six, mil, six million kina only. Today, the menstrual budgets have been increased. For instance, in 2022, we had 51 million. 2023, we increased substantially to 91 million. And uh, this year's 36, I don't have. We're expanding the village court systems in our country to ensure they address the everyday issues in our, in our place, house places, uh, in our judicial system. In our, in our judicial system for a higher court in the, in the judiciary, we're also increasing the budget by looking in 2023. For instance, we'd like giving 232 million. This year, we're increasing got 310 million. We, play, we increased already the, the judges, and I want to say thank you to the AG who's sitting here. He did a big work in making sure we increased the judges from, before it was only under 40 judges carrying the workload. We've now increased the judges to 60, and we, we will be continuing increasing judges. And I want to inform all of you, student body, we bring overseas judges also. First 10 overseas judges are on the way to come in to work in a judiciary. That is to ensure judiciaries get assisted. Fixing up menstrual services, village court, and judiciary will make work of our police much more beneficial. Is that okay? Supporting police is all now. No got court system. And um, work for police is totally in vain. And so we're working our courts to ensure that our court system is uh, lifted up and our correctional services is also being attended to. And I want to also say for police, we started recruitment again after recruitment stopped over 10 years ago. In 2023, 509 were recruited. We're now having officer, officer cadets also being tra trained, and Bomana Training College is now being refurbished with a partnership with the uh, Australian uh, bilateral security arrangements. Bomana Police Training will now be a state of art police training. In case some of you uh, don't want to be a student in your career, uh, police also is opening up. I'm looking at the police pay structure so that we could pay our policemen and women even better, so it becomes a carrier of their choice. So Bomana Police uh, College is a national center of excellence for our police force, and I want to inform all of you, in 2019, police force was still under 5,000. Today, we are building to bring our police force all the way up to 10,000 kina through uh, 10,000 uh, uh, police uh, force. Hopefully, in 2030s, we should have a 10,000 police force that is working. I want to give you all my assurance that uh, law and order remains a problem it is our focus. Key factor includes rural urban migration. Uh, key factor includes youths looking for opportunity for job and every other uh, tribal and custom practice that still perpetuate violence. Uh, we're working to strengthen police and our court system and our prison. Some of you would have known those who have gone. Today, you said you got gone or homemade. Please, me, you see this plan. You plan to can talk about tribes limit and holiday. You all him gone. Now, police arrest him you and life your imprisonment. And law me plan sense in and mister. And so modernizing a policy is something we're doing, looking at, uh, doing, and it will take some time. Uh, once we reach a 10,000 police force, in between now and the 10,000 police force, there's a special police unit being trained to deal with specific high sort of crime areas in our country. So a specialized police unit, we've tried our mobile, now we're trying to step up uh, something in between mobile and uh, defense force, but with a rapid deployment response ability. And I went to Australia, I saw the facility they have down there, 
And I said, bring it up. And the training is going on. About 200 to 300 policemen will be specially trained. They will have no number. They will be unmarked. Their task is to go and put up a fire happening in one part of our country. So this is going on as I, as I speak. All right, coming back to your Tesla's book allowance, I think I spoke on this already. Uh, you know, you are being supported. We're looking at a support program for you. Very soon, your own minister will announce uh, GPA level. Uh, if you hit this GPA, then state takes care of your boarding, lodging, and accommodations. Am I right? Uh? And I want to apologize to you. No can think of some sampler, Mipla Salim, US, India, and all them all important. Sampler, you need Salim or some too. I'm missing up, I talk to Libla. Sometimes people ask me, did you study in Australia or New Zealand elsewhere? But I said, I'm a fully homegrown student man here in this. <laughs> so I'm like, talking about that all go outside too, they're under scholarship program. And for you, the best students that are retained and studying, the program will come after the second year. When you hit this level of GPA, your country pays for your school fee. So we'll tidy this program together. Am I right? Is it okay with you? So your government is okay, uh, willing to pay for you. I'm just proposing a GPA of 4.4. 4, 4. They may tell me 4.5 or 5. Uh, you know, please be realistic. My students uh, are not all here to <laughs> get you a 5. Uh, let's go at a level where it shows discipline, good work, good study, and, and we assist the parents and the students in, in such tough times going. You never know. One of you may be prime minister after me. And uh, you can say, thanks to your GPA-based interventions, I did my degree, and I'm here working, and I'm now uh, contributing back to the country. So I want to give you all assurance to all my children who are studying. Uh, give your best shot for your country. It is no easy time we're in. Last four years has been hard four years. COVID-19, once in a hundred year event, reset the global economy. Thank goodness Papua New Guinea wasn't hit too hard. Many economists felt the pains of the COVID-19. Then the Ukraine war and the Russia war and others, but we're coming through with it. Managing politics and trying to do work is not easy to anyway, uh, but we are trying to keep our heads above water to ensure that our country still is on a positive growth trajectory. The best contribution you can do for your country right now in the 49th, 49th anniversary of our independence is respect to the rule of law in our country. As I conclude, I know you love your country, you care for your future, and you petition me. Former prime ministers were too high not to come to university to receive petition. <laughs> but I see myself not as a prime minister, I see as the number one father in this country. <laughs> so I speak to you as my children now, listening outside and here. Our country will still go through tough times, even into the 2030s, when we grow the economy, it'll still be tough. Inflation will always be amidst us. Uh, job setting will always be amidst us. But we can make our country better today. And we one year short of our 50th next year. You are students at the right time in the face of our 50th anniversary. You can say, forget tribe, forget different religions you affiliate to. Forget ethnicity. Forget everything else except PNG first. This year going to next year. You gave me petition because you love your country and you want to put PNG first. And I come here because I'm accountable to you. You are my children. Uh, you are my constituency. And I have to hear you and try to respond to you. If you so give me time uh, into, the, in, in, into the balance of this year, I will get trustee and everyone else to come and interface with you and some of the suggestions you may have in what we put forward. Now, Mr. Prime Minister, I think this is where you, uh, how you can do it. Uh, give me your statistics and data, not just students, but the faculty here. Uh, the faculty here must be the sharpest. Uh, you must also be able to criticize government from an arm's length, but tell us, government, this is what you can do better in the context of where we are today. And so we're willing to come back here, but as we stay Today, Saturday, Sunday, and Independence on Monday. Saturday, lot of time, lot of lines are giving Sabbath. Sunday, lot of time, lot of line, Yibla, it's a lot of Sunday. And I want the country, I'm using this moment together, united, take our country on the past. And how our fathers, the Somali generation, took us with absolute nothing to where we are today. 
and how you can be a good voice to continue to advocate for what is right and to bring Wagani central government to you when you feel that something needs to be done correctly so that together in common purpose to grow our country, we can progress for Papua New Guinea to be better. I want to say thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to address you in a civilized manner. In a very civilized manner, you have done better than past generations. <laughs> My generation, I don't know Mr. Gera's generation, but uh, or Mr. Ninigi's generation, I think he was a couple of years ahead of me. These two were some years behind me at UPNC. All UPNC alumni is here. So you, 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 you need to appear you. UPNC, UPNC. We become the foundation of UPNC alumni and contribute back to our own school. <laughs> but we were, when we were coming through, we protest and ban cars. 1991, we had a massive protest here. Ban over 16 cars. School was shut for the rest of the academic year. Guess what? Government never changed. The same government lived through 1992, but student changed. Student never came back. Some of my peers never came back to school in 1992. I was a privileged lot to come back to 1992 and end my degree in 1990, fall of 1994. And I look back today, uh, what were we doing? In the national interest, we were pursuing something, a discourse. That was correct, but the modus operandi was wrong. We became the victim. And the politicians lived on. I want to ask you, this way of doing business is the most modern and civic way of doing it. You hold us to account, we come to you, not you come to us. Not you come to us in protest. You come to us in protest, I remember 10 years later in 2001, I was then a public servant in Waigani. I watched in one eyes, students sought at now the refurbished pineapple building. Four lives were lost. So we don't want to do this. In your country, you have every right to advocate for what you feel is right. But in this sort of manner, when we hold each other account, one day you could call ICAC. I, we set up ICAC as part of our law enforcement agency to fight corruption. SRC president, you can call ICAC in. You can call ombudsman in. You can call police in. Ask them, what are you doing in this aspect of your constitutional duty? You can call any one of us in any time and to tell us that we must work. All our citizens and public servants' moral conscience must always be on the right space, and that is to progress Papua New Guinea. Happy 49th, I just want to say, we had work doing our best for all of you. Thank you, Tomas.